Most professing Christians, ministers, and lay members insist the Ten Commandments are done away, that they are no longer binding on Christians. Repeating what they have heard without seeking proof, they call God's law Moses' law and claim it was abolished by Jesus' sacrifice. So many millions have no idea the difference between the law of Moses and the law of God. Ignorance and an attempt to minimize the Ten Commandments is only required for a limited time have caused most to believe these laws did not exist before Moses received them at Sinai or after Christ died. Is this true? Is this what the Bible teaches? What verses can be examined so you can know? This broadcast presents the truth. The World to Come the Restored Church of God presents David C. Pack, author of 80 books and booklets, editor-in-chief of The Real Truth magazine, read by countless and growing numbers in every nation and territory of the world. In a violent age full of war, famine, pollution, disease, disasters, and economic uncertainty, and ever-worsening bad news, Answering life's greatest questions straight from the Bible and announcing the wonderful good news of the world to come. And now, David C. Pack. Who has not heard of or seen the movie The Ten Commandments? People love the story, but how many ever think about or talk about, let alone study, the commands that the movie describes? Very few people actually study their Bible. Yet every Christian hopes for salvation. A young ruler asked Jesus, What good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Of course, most would answer, You don't have to do anything. Just believe in Jesus. But Jesus disagrees. His answer? If you will enter into life, keep the commandments. He went on to list half of them to make clear what he meant, and so no one thought just Having love was enough. Why don't worldly ministers tell you about this verse? Why don't they thunder that the Ten Commandments must be kept or you cannot have eternal life? Because they know members will seek another minister who speaks more about mercy and love if they do. And love can conveniently mean whatever one needs it to. The Bible, which defines every principle and law governing life, is the standard in directing our paths. God's Word asks, How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to your word. Adding, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. But not if you don't read it. Throughout history, sailors and navigators have used the Big Dipper to locate the North Star. It revealed their orientation and heading. In the same way, the Ten Commandments are the universal standard by which all human beings establish and keep their spiritual bearing. These commands form the core of God's laws with many scriptures expanding on them. They define the boundaries people need to develop godly character and reveal when we are on or off course toward eternal life. But God's law is much more than a navigational instrument, and the Old Testament contains many verses that present God's view of a law millions believe is now null and void. Let's read just a few, asking if they sound like a law God would later render obsolete, kept for them by Christ, as so many believe. The psalmist declared, All your commandments are righteousness, and open you my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Why does no one ever quote King David? The law of the Lord is perfect, converting or restoring the soul, and the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. How can anyone think God would discard such a marvelous law? Those who believe His law is done away or nailed to the cross have great trouble explaining why God would abandon a law He describes in such glowing terms, a law the Apostle James called the royal law of liberty. Trying to spiritualize it away, as so many do, grows more difficult when one considers just a few other verses. For instance, Solomon ended Ecclesiastes with this powerful summary. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. 
Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole man. Found in the Old Testament, this could only mean the Ten Commandments. Ask, how could such a conclusion no longer apply, particularly when the very next verse warns, God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Why are not more people concerned with such sobering warnings? Yes, why? Now an almost identical statement about what God wished for ancient Israel. Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, not just until New Testament times, that it might be well with them and with their children, get this, forever. And why don't more Bible students recognize the gravity of this next verse? He that turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. This is serious, yet how often is it quoted from pulpits? Many more passages could be shown, like his physical laws governing the universe, making all things run smoothly. God's laws govern a Christian's life, producing the true peace, real happiness, and ultimate success that all want. But does the New Testament teach every commandment? Can one turn to passages there to prove each one is still binding, that Christians must keep all ten commandments? Most who profess to follow Christ believe God's commands were abolished by Jesus' sacrifice. They believe Jesus came to do away with these supposedly harsh laws. Some believe He reinstituted some of them, while others believe He replaced the Ten Commandments with a new command or commandments. Such people may be sincere, but they are sincerely wrong, having been deceived by the God of this world who has used His ministers to spoon-feed them false ideas. Instead of allowing the Bible to interpret itself, most people read into Scripture whatever meaning they have been handed, assuming it correct. They gloss over Christ's plain words, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. In other words, the Old Testament. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven not kingdom in heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in God's kingdom. Think, the sky will fall literally before God's law disappears. The Greek for fulfill can also mean satisfy, complete, or accomplish. And, as in the law coming to an end, would not fit the context because the verse would read, I am not come to destroy, but to end. End and destroy mean the same. The prophet Isaiah foretold that Christ will magnify the law and make it honorable. Throwing it out would hardly fit this. What about you? Will you let the Bible speak plainly? Will you let it interpret itself? Will you approach Scripture with an open mind and let God speak His will to you through His Word? If so, you have already separated yourself from most professing believers. Jesus is clear. This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they, the masses, worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. Why don't preachers tell you about this verse? Because they know people will leave and they will lose income. The Bible plainly says God gives His Spirit to those who obey Him. First, how important is God's Spirit? The Bible answers this too. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So one must obey God to have His Spirit. And if you do not have His Spirit, you are not a Christian. Ministers do not tell people about these verses. They dare not. Their jobs would be at risk. On Pentecost, A.D. 31, Jesus built His church through the teachings of the apostles and prophets. 
Ever since, the true church has continued in the apostles' original teachings. Peter and John instructed Christians to walk as Christ walked, live the way He lived. The apostle Paul told Christians, both Jews and Gentiles, to follow Him as He followed Christ. So then, did Jesus Christ teach the Ten Commandments? Did He instruct His apostles to teach them? In other words, are all Ten Commandments taught in the New Testament? Some basic facts that most never hear. The Ten Commandments were never referred to as the Law of Moses, but rather the Law of God. Moses' Law consisted of, one, the civil laws, which were statutes and judgments he relayed to the people from God, recorded in Exodus 21 to 23, and in the remaining books of the law, and two, the ritualistic laws, or Greek, ergon, that were added later. Read Hebrews 9, verse 10. They were ordinances regulating the temple duties of the tribe of Levi, as well as sacrifices. Read Leviticus chapters 1 through 7, and associated functions. The word ergon means works, as in the works of the law, such as in Galatians 2.16. This refers to the labor involving the Levitical rituals that were abolished by Christ's sacrifice. All the commandments were in force millennia before they were given to Israel at Sinai. It is easy to prove they date from creation. The Ten Commandments were never part of Moses' law or the Levitical sacrificial system, but the civil laws and sacrifices were based on God's commands. Thus, the commandments precede and transcend any and every lesser law or practice based upon them, statutes, judgments, precepts, and ordinances. The Ten Commandments are God's spiritual laws, and they are no less active than the laws of gravity and inertia. Just as breaking physical laws carries physical consequences, breaking spiritual laws brings spiritual consequences. There is cause and effect in life. Think. The world is filled with war, famine, disease, poverty, ignorance, religious confusion, political corruption, and every form of misery. This is because man will not keep laws that would keep him if he did, but will also break anyone who breaks them. Understand, God has now begun a period of great punishment on a sinning, disobedient world, and this punishment will only grow worse, much, much worse. Therefore, obeying God's law is seen to be much more than an academic or theological study. Now notice this. The law is holy, and the commandment holy, just, and good, for we know that the law is spiritual. Ask, does Paul's description here of the law, inspired by God, sound like it has been done away, that obedience to it is now obsolete? The first four commandments teach man how to love God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any graven image or bow down to them. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Jesus summarized them in Matthew 22. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. For those who say he did not repeat the first four verbatim, try to picture one he might no longer care about. Can we now serve other gods, worship idols, or take God's name in vain? The Sabbath will be addressed momentarily. The World to Come program will return after this brief message. Be sure to regularly view The World to Come. It is unlike anything you've seen before. The subject of this broadcast is only one of the many biblical topics that are misunderstood and misinterpreted by modern Christianity. The Law of God, the origin of traditional holidays, salvation, heaven, hell, and the purpose of the family, the Sabbath, real faith, proper baptism, true conversion, financial laws, and numerous others are covered on this program. On the world to come, you will hear the plain truth of these subjects and many more. You will also hear world news examined in the light of Bible prophecy, its biggest elements made easy to understand. Tune in for every broadcast. And now, back to David C. Pack. When the devil tried to tempt Jesus while he fasted in the wilderness, Jesus quoted the first commandment. 
Get you behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Christ spoke about the second command in John 4.24, when he taught that men cannot use physical objects, images, or aids, in other words, idols, to worship a spirit God. Since God is spirit, John records his followers must worship him in spirit. The Apostle Paul also taught the second command, declaring, Neither be you idolaters, as were some of them. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, making a golden calf. Carnal-minded Israel lacked the faith to worship a God they could not see, so they made physical ones. God knew this would happen. Throughout history, man has rejected the Creator to worship parts of His creation. Jesus himself taught both directly and indirectly against breaking any commandments, saying, Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, the sixth command, adulteries, the seventh command, fornications, thefts, the eighth command, false witness, the ninth one, blasphemies, meaning evil speaking, railing, or vilification against God, the third commandment, taking God's name in vain. Matthew 19 adds the fifth commandment to this list, spoken by Christ. Honor your father and mother. Jesus summarized these as you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The second greatest commandment. Jesus qualified what he meant by love. But again, without explanation, love can be whatever people say it is. At this juncture, an inset is required, asking the question, what is sin? People don't know. They typically answer, Jesus died for our sins. We would re-ask, but what is sin? And then comes, I don't know, but Jesus died for it. But shouldn't we all know what sin is, since it required the death of Jesus Christ, who was God? Shouldn't we know why God had to die, why we need a Savior? It mocks His sacrifice to say no. The Apostle John answers, sin is the transgression of the law. He added, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, get this, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous, they are not harsh, and this is love, that we walk after His commandments. Paul told the Romans, love is the fulfilling of the law. The fourth commandment, observing the seventh-day Sabbath, is the one most professing Christians refuse to obey, assuming men have the authority to change the Sabbath to whatever day pleases them or is convenient. Yet Jesus kept the Sabbath on the seventh day, not Sunday, the first day. Let's see. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. In fact, the New Testament records that Christ is Lord also of the Sabbath, not Sunday. And Paul wrote, Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Paul followed Jesus' example, teaching in the synagogues on the Sabbath, never Sunday. And not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles. When the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them, get this, the next Sabbath. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. And finally, Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Did you know this? Most never ask why Paul would teach Gentiles who were unfamiliar with Sabbath keeping to meet on the Sabbath. Think, why is there no evidence he led them to Sunday, the supposed Lord's Day? The subject of Sabbath keeping requires a full book to contain all available proof. Saturday or Sunday, which is the Sabbath, reveals much more detail about the fourth commandment. The last six commandments instruct man how to never hurt his fellow man, how to love him. Years after Jesus' sacrifice, Paul was still teaching this to Gentile converts in Rome. You shall not commit adultery. He recorded, You shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In Ephesians, Paul commanded Christians to obey the fifth commandment by honoring their parents, and to obey the ninth command, 
Let's read. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. How wonderful it would be if every man and woman today only told the truth. What a different world than the one we have. Yet the Apostle Paul is often described as having dismissed the law because he taught salvation comes by faith in Jesus' sacrifice. But read his words. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yes, we establish the law. Establish can be translated stand, continue, and hold up. The meaning is obvious. Why then would the ministers of this world not tell you these things? Oh, that every preacher would speak to you the truth. You are being lied to. Paul added, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, You shall not covet, the tenth commandment. Did Paul reject the law? Again, his answer, God forbid. James also warned about the dangers of breaking the last command. Let's read. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. We live in a world of almost nothing but lust for illicit sex, material possessions, drugs, money, fame, power, pleasure, you name it. After examining all these biblical proofs, some will still believe the Ten Commandments were abolished, refusing to give up what they want to believe. They may even claim God's law was replaced by a new commandment that Jesus and John taught. But what is this new commandment, and does it supersede the Ten Commandments? Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Jesus is giving a new and higher standard to love others as He loves us. Only those with God's Spirit dwelling in them can love people the way Christ does. Leviticus 19.18 had long ago declared, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love is not new. But the Jews had ignored it, so when Jesus emphasized it, it seemed like a new command. And He explained that men must love each other as He loved them. That was new. John makes this even clearer. I beseech you, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto you, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. This scripture so obviously does not replace or do away with the Ten Commandments. It reinforces them with an emphasis on the same love required since creation. Here is the problem that is unknown to almost everyone. It explains why people so quickly reject God's law. The carnal or natural mind is enmity, is hostile against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you, Christians, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Recall from before, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, no one else. This describes true Christians, those of God's church. There is no hint that God ever did away with, suspended, or replaced His law with love or any other religious-sounding phrase. God's law existed long before Moses from the time of creation. All Ten Commandments were taught throughout the New Testament and are in effect today. No one thinks murder is good, the same with adultery, stealing, or lying. They just don't want to be commanded not to do these things preferring to believe Christians avoid them voluntarily. After all we have seen, some few may still insist keeping God's law is unnecessary, arguing Christians are freed from everything God commanded under the Old Covenant. This is not true. Which part of God's Old Testament instruction should we throw away? Returning to an amazing passage begins the answer. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. 
Certainly nothing here to throw away. Most are confused about what Christ's sacrifice actually did away with and therefore what God requires of his people today. Many view the Old Covenant this way. If priestly duties, ceremonial washings, and animal sacrifices are done away, then so is everything God commanded under the Old Covenant. The question at its core is, how can things required of ancient Israel and defined in such detail be no longer binding while other things are? Confusion stems from misunderstanding the relevance today of the many laws given to Israel. Understanding begins with defining the term civil law. It is any mandate, decree, rule, or code regulating conduct and activity within a defined jurisdiction. The civil laws God gave Israel through Moses are presented in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. They reveal how to apply the Ten Commandments. Together, the commandments, civil laws, statutes, and sacrificial laws constitute the Old Covenant. What was required of Israel and adhered to by the Jews of Christ's day that Christians must still practice today? To properly understand, recognize a few basic principles. Israel was a physical, carnal-minded nation without God's Spirit. They were not offered eternal salvation. Many places in the Old Testament call them the Congregation of Israel. Acts 7 calls Israel the church in the wilderness. God chose Israel to be a physical type of His New Testament church, those begotten of His Holy Spirit. Notice, these things, Israel's experiences, were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Israel's slavery in Egypt, deliverance under Moses, crossing the Red Sea, and wandering in the wilderness were recorded so true Christians can learn from their experiences. Without God's Spirit, Israel could not properly keep God's spiritual laws. Recall Romans 8.8. 8. So God gave them a long list of specific physical do's and don'ts to keep them on track. The Israelites could not obey God in spirit and in truth. Recall John. Because this was impossible, they needed constant physical reminders. It is also impossible to please God without faith, and true faith is both a fruit and a gift of the Holy Spirit. Only by receiving the Holy Spirit can one become a true Christian and learn to obey God in all points. We're out of time, but there is much more to learn. Part 2 will be helpful for those who want more depth. In the meantime, read our full book, The Ten Commandments, Nailed to the Cross or Required for Salvation. You will be glad you did. Until next time, this is David C. Pack saying goodbye, friends. This program was made available by Restored Church of God members and donors from around the globe. Explore our vast library of literature and other World to Come programs, which are all made available free of charge. To order literature featured in this program, call toll-free 1-855-828-4646. That number again, 1-855-828-4646.